All right, plan for this morning is just to wrap up uh, convention preview. My big thanks to Pastor Wayne Eichstead for putting these slides together. Um, so some of this stuff I have a better understanding of than others. Uh, there's a big section on changes to the church extension fund and proposals for that. I don't know how familiar you are with that, Steve. Sat in on the, okay. Um, that was the big section I didn't, I, I don't, not sure I understand everything going on, but I'll try to give you my best uh, overview and a thumbnail sketch, especially for our delegates prepping for our delegate conference and pastoral conference. We'll start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for making us members of your kingdom and giving us the opportunity to participate in this ministry. We pray that you would equip us as your servants to know your will, to make decisions that glorify you and are for the good of our brother. Help us in our upcoming conventions. Grant us the unity of peace and the bond of the spirit and strengthen us and equip us to be your representatives and your witnesses throughout the world as you've made us uh, your disciples and called us to go forward with that gospel message. Bless us and be with us for your namesake. Amen. All right, so convention this year, again, is a delayed convention. This should have been the 2020 convention, uh, but because of COVID, that had to change. Uh, the theme for our convention is the Great Commission. Uh, there'll be two essays, uh, presentations on uh, the Great Commission, making disciples of all nations, how Jesus provides the means and Jesus promises his presence. Some of the reports that will be coming forward, uh, Committee 1 takes up the President's report. Uh, some of the things he mentioned at, uh, this will be President Michael Leichstead, uh, some of the things he mentioned at Coordinating Council, how there's two congregations applying for CLC membership. There's a congregation in Con uh, Conroe, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. Uh, our Shepherd Lutheran Church is made up of uh, Member, former members of the Spring, uh, I think it was Spring, Spring, Texas, yeah, members there that left uh, over pastoral concerns, and now they reformed uh, our shepherd, or started up a new congregation in Con Conroe. Also, the congregation in Melrose, Wisconsin, St. Paul's Lutheran Church, kind of a neat history on that congregation. Um, they had left uh, years before the breakup of the Synodical Conference. They were essentially an independent congregation. Um, and they had been without a pastor for two or three years. And then during the pandemic, they were looking for sermons uh, for lay preachers to present. And they stumbled across uh, on Facebook the sermons of Chad Sebit and started drawing on uh, Pastor Chad Sebit's sermons um, and that caused them, ended up that someone at the congregation had worked with Pastor Siebert's wife when Pastor Siebert's wife was a teacher in uh, Melrose Maduro School there. Um, so kind of a neat way that the Lord brings people together even in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, of course, we'll be taking up the joint statement. Uh, there'll be the pil building program. We'll get that at the end of the slides. Um, and then memorials that will be coming before uh, the convention. And he will have his convention report that will, be, uh, that will open the convention and kind of set the stage for the convention itself. Questions on the president's report? No. Uh, some of the memorials that deal with the joint statement, uh, a summary statement from the South Eastern Delegate Conference, so this would be uh, Missouri, Texas, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, um, those congregations. Their delegate conference sent a memorial to the convention to consider that we abandon the joint statement as a basis for resolving the doctrinal differences between the CLC and the Wells Ls on the doctrine of the termination of church fellowship. Uh, so that's one memorial. Uh, Pastor Paul Tiefel has submitted a memorial uh, with discussions with Wells Ells. 
Uh, he encourages the convention uh, to direct the committee to work with the two other synods and seek clarification on two points. And I think if you read my summary, um, I tried, Pete. I tried to make a summary. You said a paragraph, less than a paragraph. A three by five card, really small print. I could have maybe got it on a three by five. Um, but I told my wife, I said, well, I have two sentences that are really important. The rest, you know, but I tried. Uh, and this kind of goes toward my concerns with joint statements. Uh, clarification on two points. Number one, the placement of passages and subpoints dealing with admonition in the section titled Romans 16, 17, and 18 prompts this question. Is there any room for admonition in Romans 16, 17? Uh, one of the questions we had last week is, uh, is there no room for admonition? Yes, there's room for admonition. Not with Romans 16, 17. Romans 16, 17, you've already taken note of someone causing divisions and offenses. And then God says, avoid them. If you've noted they've caused, they're causing divisions and offenses, you avoid them. So with Romans 16, there's no room for admonition. You're giving admonition before you get to that point. But once you get to that point and you've noted they're causing divisions and offenses, then God says, avoid them. Uh, so the Board of Doctrine has those same concerns. Um, and Pastor Tiefel, his memorial, uh, goes toward that question. And then number two... Does the note or mark of Romans 16, 17 include a process of evaluation before conclusively identifying a group that is a series of steps, or is it an application of a judgment to a readily identifiable group that is one step? Uh, so the Board of Doctrine in their report says uh, the CLC sees it as a step. You've reached a judgment. They're causing divisions and offenses. You're to avoid them. Uh, the wells in their past writings um, explains Romans 16 as a process. So you're watching out for causes and divisions and offenses. If you spot them, then you've got to admonish them to see if they're going to be weak brothers or false teachers. And if you conclude that they're false teachers, then you avoid them. But again, the simplicity of Romans is pretty straightforward. Uh, we don't want to add anything to what God is saying in that verse. Yes. Um, what passages? Um, there's examples of Paul admonishing Peter for being hypocritical, where Peter was eating with Gentiles when there were no Jews around, but when there were Jews around, um, Peter would eat with, would only eat with the Jews, and Paul calls him out on that. So he admonishes them. Um, I think that those who formed the CLC, they admonished the wells before we, they broke that this is not the right course. We should not be doing this. Uh, but they stayed the course, and then they noted that, well, now Wisconsin's causing divisions and offenses, and then avoided them. Um, and you continue to admonish afterward. I mean, we, how long have we been admonishing wells? For 60 years, right? So the admonition doesn't end because you care about them. You want them to see the error and you want that to draw them out of that error. Um, but Romans is talking about, okay, you've identified them as causing divisions and offenses. You've identified them as false teachers. You've already reached that point. Now you avoid them. So, any other questions? So Tifa would like to see... Uh, the committee continue their work and also address these two questions and continue addressing the other doctrinal issues we have with the Wisconsin Synod. Uh, one other memorial, again from the Southeast Conference. Uh, one of these was submitted in for the 2020 convention and another was submitted uh, this last year for the 2021. Uh, resolve, we affirm that our confessional practice of testing what is said against official statements and practices Resolved that the official meetings between Wells, CLC, Wells Ells be discontinued until Wells Ells specifically acknowledges the above referenced official statements that are in conflict with Romans 16, 17. So this memorial, this is just a summary. If you looked in the prospectus, they lay out a, a case for 
why uh, we should discontinue discussions until we address these issues and um, come to a conclusion. So you can see the full spectrum of how to handle the joint statement and discussion with the committees. Do you end it because we can't even come to a conclusion on various statements, or do you continue on and continue to work to clarify things? So I think that's probably the two basic positions um, you're going to find in the CLC. Board of Ed and Publications, uh, they're going to be looking at producing a new catechism. I know here at Berea, we've been looking at catechisms over the last year in the Board of Elders and with the faculty here. Um, they're exploring it. They haven't made a decision yet, so this would replace the Red Siddle Catechism. Uh, they're going to put a, a committee together and bring it to the next coordinating council. So the committee will meet. They'll bring a proposal in spring um, 2022, it would be. Um, I think it's further action at the next coordinating council, so maybe it would be fall. I'm not sure where that would happen. Uh, they're going to bring a recommendation, then they'll discuss it. So it could be a year, two years before there's really any, um, anything solid put together. Questions on catechism? Under Board of Ed and Publication, uh, Messiah Hales Corners member John Miller um, resolves that the Board of Ed and Publications hire a professionally trained website designer to build a new CLC website from the ground up and to regularly maintain and back up the website. So we've got a number of individuals that are volunteers, um, but really, and we found that here at Berea, trying to put a, a website together um, it is very time consuming. I know anybody that's worked on one knows all the things that go into it um, in order to make that happen. So uh, John Miller would like to see us hire someone to, to do that. Board of Missions, uh, they have a new position. Uh, so Board of Missions is the board I'm, I'm on for convention, uh, the vice chair of that. Um, they have established a new mission coordinator um, and that's uh, Missionary Ullman. So now he kind of oversees everything going on instead of um, mission helper or part-time missionaries to like Paul, John Hine is over Liberia, uh, Pastor Gurath, Matt, Mark, Ger Michael Gurath oversees like Kenya. So you have all these different entities, but you want one unified body that's kind of trying to collect all the information and oversee what's going on. So keeping it up, up to date. Yeah. Yeah, I remember on our honeymoon we were going to go to a church service, um, and we looked it up online, all that, and we got there, and they're like, "No, they were here last night." And we were in town last night. We would have gone. Anyway, yeah, uh, how important that is. Because if you don't know somebody there, if you know somebody there, you can contact them directly. But if you don't, you're going to be looking online. So, yeah, maintaining that information is very important. All right. Uh, regarding the third foreign missionary, that was something the last convention authorized in 2018. They called a couple of pastors. Those calls were returned. Uh, and then COVID came, so everything just kind of stopped. Um, they do have a plan in place to resume calling when feasible. It would start, you would pay a salary for the missionary initially out of the mission development fund. There's a lot of money in there, so they say we can start it there, but then we'll wean off um, mission development fund. It'll be, first year it'll be 100% MDF, and then you'll split between MDF and general fund, and then it'll be 3070, I think, and then eventually it'll be fully funded from the general fund. So currently we pay our missionaries through the general fund. Um, 
but they want to get this going. Uh, the church body wants to get this going. I mean, who's going to vote against having another missionary? Who's going to be the guy who's like, no, I don't think we should have it. No. Um, another change on the Board of Missions. They changed the acronym Kinship. Um, I should have taken a survey to see if anybody knew what it stood for. Uh, originally, it was for work in India. Kids in need, source of help for India's poor. But now that's such a broad umbrella, does a lot of work. It's kids in need, student help, international partnership. So it, it's not just India. It's anywhere you have orphans or widows or SEM students, you can help support in their, in their work. Um, and they're removing project. It's now a committee. So these are uh, guidelines that will come before the Board of Missions Committee. Uh, Board of Trustees, so this is where we get into the fund money. Um, proposed budget for the next fiscal year, which begins July 1st of this year. Uh, I don't know if you can see that there. We are encroaching on a $2 million operation uh, in the CLC. I can still remember, I think within my ministry, when we hit a million dollars for our operation, uh, operating the CLC, and that was a big deal. And now we're uh, getting near two million. I don't have a lot to say. I've uh, don't tell the moderator, but I've for 20 years in the ministry, I have escaped finances and the board of trustees. So don't tell him that. And don't can you edit that out, Matt? Just mute me. Yeah, I am not gifted in this area, so I'm thankful that uh, God's given that gift to other people um, who can serve in that capacity. Right. So if you look down here, um, you'll see for the next fiscal year, so it's general, almost exactly 50% there. Yeah, good catch. Uh, you have 700, uh, 740,000 out of the general fund and 740,120 from student revenue. Um, and that seems to be a better balance than... And you look back here, uh, yeah, a lot of student revenue. I don't know if that's a better balance. That means there's fewer students paying tuition and room and board and such. So what does the Board of Regents say about that? I did. I did. Did you know that was a week after our baby was born and I didn't? Yeah. <laughs> limitation in uh, the region's ability to raise tuition. Um, in those prior years, 17, 18, 19, there were no tuition increases because they weren't necessary. But as student revenue or student uh, enrollment has declined over the last few years, the ability to make that up uh, in order to, I guess, the lack of a desire of the regions to put the entire burden on those that are attending by fully increasing their revenue. Those have been the, you know, the, the, two, in, the two major factors that have, uh, that have impacted that. And fewer, uh, how does room and board impact that as well? Do you, if you have more in the dorm, because you've got to heat the whole building, you've got to get food for everybody. Um, are a lot of, when, you, when you think of uh, dormitory students, the only variable cost in that is food. The rest of, we have the building, we heat the building, mm -hmm. we have the, uh, uh, the dorm parents that are there, so all of the costs associated with, uh, most of the costs that are associated with the dormitory students are already paid. So it is uh, it's additional revenue that you have. You have a, a town student, Ruben Ward 
award is about equal to what tuition is. So it's twice the cost to have someone in the dormitory than it is to have a, a guy in the kitchen. So, Those so townies. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, when I was there, it seemed like it was about a third, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Barb. Well, I, you know, don't you almost get yourself into a catch-22 here with the, uh, you know, I know that when Steve made his, made his presentation, you know, the, the deciding, or the, the most deciding factor for not sending kids there was because of distance. But if you start looking at here now, you raise the tuition, then, well, now parents say, well, now it's getting too expensive to send my student there, too, you know? Yeah. Barb was listening. that you know, when you look at right there is that the total cost would be twice. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Except the, the Senate subsidizes equally 50% across the board for each student. Yeah. So half of the tuition is subsidized by the CLC. There are some uh, multi-student discounts for families that have multiple students at school at the same time. That is, there's a financial test for that. There are uh, a lot of grants that are available for our college students, especially for those that are in uh, preparing for the, uh, the public ministry. Um, and there are some, there's a student aid fund to allow for, you know, for loans for future payment of yeah. uh, tuition. So I think it's a pretty robust program for helping minimize the cost and to not making cost factor in and why people do not send their kids. Well, there's a lot of churches that are setting up their own fund, too, for their own members, so they have the ILC. Mm -hmm. Berea is an example of yeah. that. Yeah. So basically what I said about the good balance this year is exactly wrong. So it's, You don't have to say it. I'll, I'll say it. <laughs> no, I, I think I would say good because I think it is a it is a blessing as, as it's good for the student because it, the burden is not fully on them that the church body wants to make sure this yeah. is supported. Just, yeah, just as our graduates said at the end here, our eighth grade graduates, the, the, how Berea, the importance that Berea places on Christian education and how our members provide for the Christian education here. Obviously, the CLC feels the same way in the substantial um, subsidy that people are willing to put in place in order to provide a Christian education for our students in, in high school and in the preparation for the teaching and preaching ministry. So I, I think it is, you talk about good, I think it is, it is uh, it's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Jen. I will tell you as the mother of teenage boys, it's the best deal around. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that, you save money. Oh my goodness, I pay as much in the summer as I do <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're suggesting year-round schooling, or at least meals year-round. All right, we'll move on. Uh, another big change is the CES. So this is the Church Extension Fund. Uh, this is a fund that allows congregations that may have building projects, I believe our gym was a sanctuary, and did that have a CEF loan as well? 
And there are going to be some changes with the CEF uh, loans and the focus and the guidelines. Um, this was the part I said, I don't know that I understand everything. I read it, but yeah, Pete. Church building was through a CEF loan. And we were a mission congregation then. And we stayed a mission congregation so we could get the loan. The moment we got the loan, we got off a of mission. <laughs> there you go. So it's been a lot, a big blessing for a lot of congregations. Um, Messiah Eau Claire currently has a huge, I'll just move forward. You can read in the prospectus uh, more about the proposed changes. Uh, one of them is to give a priority to mission congregations to make sure as they move forward and they want to do projects that that's supported. Um, yeah. Um, I don't think it's in here. Current, uh, there's two current CF loans, um, new ones. Masayo Claire has a huge building project for their school. And Loveland, Colorado has a building project uh, extending their sanctuary and, um, of their church, uh, Prince of Peace, Loveland. We had some code ch salary changes, uh, some increases. My understanding, uh, you have tier one and tier two. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I believe tier two is if you need financial assistance for medical insurance. They're going to give you an extra $1,000 to help with uh, medical insurance. So that's a tier two. If you don't need medical insurance, then you're considered tier one uh, base salary. And then there's increments, uh, number of years of service, um, and also pays into um, CLC retirement, as well as moving expenses, because now moving expenses are considered taxable income. And my favorite line, See report for more detailed accounting and reporting of various funds. All right. Board of Trustees uh, recommending 10-month increase to the retirement plan. Um, so that's moving forward in January 2022 and then January 2023. Um, the establishment of the general fund endowment be funded by direct contributions and undesignated bequests to the CLC. Um, so uh, maybe Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is right now, if you have a bequest, you can dedicate it to something, but this would allow you to just general synod work, whatever the board of trustees thinks needs to be done. Right now, there are several endowments that are specific. Um, student aid is one. Student aid. Uh, preparation for the public ministry is another endowment. There is not an endowment fund that allows the proceeds to help supplement the general fund budget. Um, there are a certain amount of contributions that are needed every year to fund our general fund capability. So the idea is to create an endowment for that to allow people to contribute to that so that principal and interest can go to support the general fund activities as the other endowments go to support the, the specific fund activities. All right. So you would pull off the interest from this fund to go to, towards the general fund? Yes, to handle the day-to-day the -day business activities of the CEO. Uh, revised CEF lending guidelines be formalized and approved. That's the stuff I went through very quickly. Um, they have established a mechanism that would allow congregations to offer their workers health savings accounts. Um, Constitution Committee, which is uh, Pete's baby. Um, the currently websites are supposed to be CLC, official CLC websites, so Board of Missions, clclutheran.org, I think clclutheran.net as well. I'm not sure if that one is, but uh, they're supposed to be under the auspices of the Board of Ed and Publications. Uh, however, the realization is that each board kind of does their own thing right now. So we're not really following the Constitution and they want to update the Constitution to reflect that. Is that fair? Okay. Yeah. 
So ILC has its own website, runs its own website. Board of Ed does not oversee that. Um, and same thing with missions and CLC in general. Imagine that came out of the early days of the websites when, you know, it was pretty simple to oversee and maintain <coughs> the individual websites, uh, official websites. Uh, committee of Partners in the Public Ministry, uh, they have done some work. We've had inserts. Uh, we've had Public Ministry Sunday. Um, there were articles in the Spokesman as well. Um, they have some recommendations for the church body. Uh, they want to implement a two-year pastoral training program presented by uh, the CPPM. Um, so this two-year program would be for professionals who decide to leave their profession uh, and want to enter the ministry. So this was kind of a fast track uh, to get them through the ministry. They already have degrees in something. They're usually over 35. Um, those of you who remember Dave Pavoni might know he would be an example of that. He was a man with a grown family and uh, so this is one of their plans. They see a need for more pastors, and they think this might be a way to um, open up doors for individuals thinking about the ministry, but they don't want to commit to three years of seminary and maybe two or three years prior to that of languages and so on. Um, uh, they want to look at a dual enrollment with UW-Eau Claire for teacher certification presented in 2022 convention. Uh, so put something together for our next summer's convention. Uh, look at a recruiter for the public ministry um, and appointed by, uh, established by the convention and appointed by the president. Um, all right, now what everyone wants to see, pictures. So, uh, I believe it was about a year and a half ago, uh, there was a, was it a bequest? It was a large bequest uh, from a CLC member uh, to help pay off the academic center at Emmanuel, so that's all paid off. And it also, on top of that, there was about a million left over for future projects. Um, in the list of projects put together in 88, uh, we had a commons, so that's done. That was done when I graduated high school. Uh, the new classroom, academic center offices, that's done, and the next one up was a new gymnasium. Uh, so this is the plan. So if you can picture campus, here you have the current gym, here you have the commons area where everybody eats, here's the boys' dorm, so when you come down, you come down the hill to park, and right here is where the current softball field is in this area. The plan uh, put together by the planning committee uh, would be to have a new gymnasium that in, right in that area. Um, design would be something like this. Uh, so if you were at the parking, upper parking lot, or this parking lot, you would enter the second level of the new gymnasium. You'd walk in, there'd be a mezzanine, uh, and the gym floor would be down below you with bleachers uh, below you. You could also come down here park and enter on the first floor, which would be the floor of the gymnasium where the locker rooms would be and so on. Um, design would be uh, two courts, so you'd have two practice courts here, one here, one here. Um, so you could have multiple basketball practices going on at the same time. Then you'd have bleacher seats that would pull out. This gives you a little better view. Um, of what that would look like, and then games would be played on the main court that way. Uh, what it might look like, so this would be from, uh, this is upper, okay. Uh, yeah, I was trying to see if there was a hill behind there. Okay. Okay, so if you came around, you came around the hill, you would park, and this would be level one, and this would be the mezzanine area. Um, uh, incorporated in this plan is to convert the gym into a 
chapel, a fine arts building. Uh, this is how it could look. So currently you have the two doors. They would redo the outside to make it look more like the commons and have a, a chapel entrance there. Um, timing and cost. Um, the earliest they would start would be next spring because of cost, current costs for projects. Um, likely would take 10 months. Um, those of you who have been keeping an eye on building supplies and that, you know prices are pretty high right now. So uh, the hope is that this would allow prices to come down by next spring before beginning, if the convention approves it. Um, take about 10 months. Um, and total cost would be uh, 6.5 million, uh, which is, again, a huge number. I think the academic center was at 2.5 somewhere in that ballpark. I thought that was a big number, but it's 6.5, but think of all you're doing with this. Um, this would utilize 100,000 from the existing building fund, so that's the leftovers, uh, 1 million, sorry. Uh, 250,000 uh, potentially from the sale of ILC property that we don't use. Um, contributions of uh, 750,000. A CF grant of two million, and then a 30-year interest-free CF loan. Um, okay, so that's the cost looking at the project. Uh, Pete. Did this cost include the relocation of the softball field? You're in the plan advisory. Yes, I'm on the planning. He's on the planning committee. Um, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> yes, they looked at the initial part of that cost of relocating the field. So I guess a little clarification. Moving the softball field is part of this project. Oh yeah, that's right. So that would, you know, mo moving that would be part of it because that's, they need to do that to be able to utilize that field. So it would be on the other side of the baseball field here. There was, a, there was a little concern from the initial contractor, the earthwork estimate that it would take to do that. So there's some discussion on that. But the, the plan is, as part of the approved project, would be that field needs to be moved. That would be part of the cost. Reconfiguring the existing gym is not part of this project. Right. And not part of that cost. Because there would be, they'd have to be, there were some conceptual ideas given by the architect to the committee in order to how it could be repurposed. Uh, and part of it was, was you know, the thought was converting it more into a, of a chapel environment, and um, so hence the, uh, the entryway that would be added, the cross that would be added in the front to make that you know, more aesthetic as well as uh, some of the desired seating inside. But the cost to redo that building is not part of that estimate. Yeah, they're guessing anywhere from 100000 to $1 million for that. Um, so. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the quarter million in potential property sale, you know, what does it mean? It was on that slide that you just looked at. It, it, it is the property 16 on the other there. side of Lowe's Creek. Yes. Yeah. There's some property on the other side of Lowe's Creek. I don't know the details on that, but that's, they've had some discussion on that. Really Sam good. has a look on his face like he might have a fort back there <laughs> that he's a little afraid <laughs> <great. laughs> I looked at the word inaccessible and we may or may not have built a bridge over there this year. <laughs> <laughs> Across the creek. Yeah. Jen. One thing I wanted to mention in the need of this new gymnasium is just my experience this last spring at how the gym is used and how just packed the locker rooms and that back space are. We had to clean out the locker rooms, which you think it's not that volleyball season, it was packed with band equipment and softball equipment and baseball equipment and track equipment. There's and, just, and the play. well, yeah, and there, there's just no space for, even when it's not a season when the gym would be used as heavily, there's just not space for them to be able to carry out the activities of the school, which is not necessarily just sports related, and I think that just has to be built into Greater than just a need for sports-related activities. It is there's there's a need there that's much bigger. 
No one's come up and it's 11.10, so no church at 11.10. <laughs> Pete? Well, I think one thing to realize, why there is a need. I mean, currently we have one gym, and potentially, for example, in basketball season, you could have three boys' teams and three girls' teams, and each of those need usually an hour of practice a day. So that's six hours. And they have been practicing up till 9, 10 o'clock at night just for those teams to get their practices in. Well, don't the Messiah youth teams use it too? I think usually on weekends. And, yes. Yeah, they, they make use of other gyms in, in Eau Claire oh, yeah. too. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It is. Uh, no doubt it was a very, very nice facility. But I will tell you that, that uh, the architect came up with an original plan that was substantially larger than this. And the committee did a lot of work to separate need from want and the things that um, did, a lot, did a lot of work with the, uh, with the regents. So I was technically the regents liaison, not a voting member of the committee. But we talked a lot about what was important to the regents there was a separate uh, faculty uh, liaison from the regents to get the, the faculty's opinion. A lot went into this plan. Um, foremost was, I think, what uh, others have already mentioned is really expanding and updating the facilities to allow for the use, um, you know, a better use you know, for our students to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, you know, perform that, to be able to have a separate theater area so that they can still use the existing building for, for theater practice, et cetera. Um, it uh, was identified as a need a long time ago as the third need. The other two have been satisfied. So it was uh, a wonderful project. I think the, what the convention is going to find is the echoes I've heard anyway are chapel versus gym. Religious school, and we don't have a chapel. Why don't we have a chapel? So I think that's going to be part of the discussion that'll come up on the floor. I think the dollar amount is going to be part of the discussion that comes up on the floor. Um, but I think the dollar amount is important. I think anyone that looks at uh, well, the last project was two and a half million. This is six and a half million. You know, why? Well, one, it's a lot more square footage. Two, the um, the Academic Center came in over budget because they did not have a contingency fund that they needed. This includes a contingency. So at least there's a potential that they might come in under budget rather than over budget with the contingency. I think that uh, the, the trustees have talked a lot about this from the CEF grants and the CEF loans and looking at the payment stream. And it kind of was glazed over a little bit on the bottom, but the payment stream, repayment stream, is actually less than the payment stream that we had just continued with uh, CEF. We're looking okay. at the, a loan then of about $7,000 a month versus eight that was currently done with the academic center. So it's actually a, a reduction in the uh, expected budgetary uh, you know, cash flow need. I think that the, the uh, what the committee looked at was really the convention direction. I think there has been a lot of discussion at prior conventions, but the convention directive was towards a gymnasium, not towards a repurposing of a chapel area. And, but yet this gives that footprint, mm -hmm. the ability, and I think the price tag is, is you have an option in that physical space to redesign it or take it down to the foundation and build everything up. Uh, with the area of it being more of, of a sanctuary set uh, that would be available for drama, et cetera. On the CEF grant, so the CEF has $2 million that they can just give to this project that doesn't need to be repaid? Well, that was the, the, in the earlier report in some of the numbers is the CEF has grown substantially. Mm -hmm. in, so the thought is that put a grant out of there would be a better use out of that than a loan to have the CLC you know, repay itself yeah. and 
and okay. charge more interest on that. So, yes. All right. That obviously would require convention approval, but that is an area we're going to be planning. So this is all just a planning. If the uh, convention approves it, then a building committee will be put together and Well, I remember the process for the academic center. That took a, that was a slog. It took a number of years to finalize what we were eventually going to do, and the end product I think everybody believes is beautiful. The other project that you had mentioned was, and there was a, a slight slide on it, is that if it would be approved this year, construction could not begin until next spring. A significant part of that is the lead time for steel and precast concrete. That are two big components. Mm -hmm. of and also a desire to not build during the winter months. Yeah, because you got to take go into that hill, and that's going to be quite a project if that's approved. All right, and then Sam will talk about when I went to school at Emanuel. All right, thank you. Uh, reminder that convention uh, will be streamed. Um, on the ILC EDU website. Uh, you can watch it online. Um, that'll be available for you from home. Not sure they have all sorts of COVID plans, but since the prospectus came out, that's all changed in Eau Claire. So I'm not sure what, what it's gonna look like as far as uh, spacing and requirements along those lines, but. Uh, Opened up, yep. yep. Okay, again, uh, Pete Sitto, Jamie Arndt, myself are representing Berea, so if you have any feedback on any of these things you want us to take along, uh, please speak with one of us, and we'll try to represent the congregation as best we can. <laughs>